Hello everyone. Welcome back to SJ's classes. We'll continue to read Kalidasa's poem Ridhu Samhara in this video. I have posted two other videos on this particular poem on my YouTube channel. In the very first video, I have given an introduction to this great Sanskrit poet and dramatist Kalidasa and also an introduction to this mini epic which is Rudu Samhara. In the second video, I have discussed the first 10 stanzas of Candle One Summer of Rudu Samhara. Please do watch these earlier videos to get a complete understanding of the work. After reading the first 10 stanzas, we understood that it is the summer season that Kalidasa is talking about. We have couples, we have people who are struggling to overcome the intense heat of the sun during this season. It is night time. People are longing for night time because it's extremely hot during the daytime. Even though they have houses you know, which are built with water bodies around, with, <clears throat> with fountains around. And they have to use gems, liquid sandal to get relief from the scorching heat of the summer season. Women, they try to soothe their lovers using their sandal scented breasts, the fine silk and jewel belts that they use, their curving hips, Women, they try to ease their lovers using these physical aspects. Women, even they are suffering and struggling under the extreme heat of the sun. They throw off their heavy garments and put on thin stoles. And we understand that the couples, they are struggling to overcome this particular season. Men's hearts are churned by desire, seeing the physical aspects of women. And women, they use their physical aspects to help their lovers get rid of the you know, extreme heat that they are experiencing as part of the season. So these are some of the details that we got after reading the first 10 stanzas. In this video lesson, we will discuss the next 10 stanzas and what you find in the next 10 stanzas is Kalidasa describing how this particular season has affected the animal and plant kingdom let's read the 11th stanza antelopes suffering from summer's savage heat raised with parched throats towards distant sky the color of smooth blended coal, thinking there is water there in another forest. So as I said earlier, uh, Kalidasa describes in the following stanzas how the summer season affects the plant and animal kingdom. So in this stanza we have antelopes. The antelopes are a variety of deer with upward pointing horns. I hope you have seen them. So antelopes suffering from summer's savage heat race with parched throats. Parched means dried out and they are thirsty. Uh, you know when it's summer season when you when there is extreme you know, when, it, when it is extremely hot you will feel thirsty frequently. So this is what has happened with the antelopes as well. So they are racing with parched throats towards the distant sky. The color of smooth blended coal. So, uh, from far, the sky seems to be having the color of, you know, blended coal. Coal is that cosmetic preparation, you know, that is used to darken the edges of the eyelids. So, from far, it seems like, you know, the distant sky has a coal-like color. And they race the antelopes they race thinking there is water in another forest so they are racing 
no one another with this particular idea in their mind that there is water in another forest. But we know that summer season has come through or is there throughout that place. So they might not probably find water in the next forest as well. As enchanting twilights jewel by the moon, instantly kindle desire in pleasure seekers' minds, so do the graceful movements, subtle smiles and wavered glances of amorous women. So again we have a slight shift to the human world. Uh, Kalidasa says that just like the twilight which kindles desire in pleasure seekers, the graceful movements, smiles and glances of women evoke desire in men. So there is a little bit of digression that happens here. Uh, all the other paragraph, I mean, stanzas discuss uh, how summer season has affected the animal world, but you have an exception in stanza 12. Kalidasa again shifts to the human world in this particular stanza. So, women with their graceful movements and subtle smiles, subtle means you know, something which is difficult to be understood. So, subtle smiles and wayward glances. Wayward means something which cannot be assisted. Wayward glances of amorous woman. Amorous means displaying love. So just like you know, twilight that evokes desire, women with these aspects, they evoke passion and desire in man. In an agony of pain from the sun's fierce rays, scorched by dust on his path, a snake with drooping hood creeps on his tortuous course, repeatedly hissing, to find shelter under a peacock's shade. So snakes and peacocks, they are generally considered as enemies. But the summer season has forced this particular snake to find shelter under a peacock's shade. So we find that they are not enemies anymore. You know, the snake is disturbed or he is in agony. He is in the agony of pain from the sun's fierce rays and he is scorched by the dust. And the dust is hot as well. So he is scorched by the dust and he takes on this tortuous course. Tortuous means highly complex. You know how a you know, snake moves ahead. It's in a convolute, it takes a convoluted path, a complex path. So that is what is being described by the phrase tortuous course. And he repeatedly hisses, he has dropped his hood, which means that he is not going to attack and he takes shelter under a peacock. So, enemies have become friends because of the season. And we find the same happening with the other animals as well. The king of beasts suffering intense thirst, pants, with wide open jaws, lolling tongue, quivering mane, Powerless to attack, he does not kill elephants, though they are not beyond his reach. So, in the previous stanza, we saw that peacocks and snakes have become friends. And in this stanza, we find that the king of beasts, which is the lion, who is suffering from intense thirst, and he has you know, uh, kept his jaws wide open. And he has a lolling tongue. Lolling tongue means a tongue that hangs loosely out. And he has a quivering mane. Mane refers to the long hairs of the lion. And it's trembling. It's shivering. And the king of beasts is described as something which is powerless to attack. He is powerless to attack because he is thirsty. He wants water. He does not kill elephants. Normally he should have attacked the elephant, but he should he as of now he doesn't attack the elephants, and they aren't beyond his reach. They are within his reach. He could have attacked them and killed them, but he is powerless to attack. So the snake finds shelter under a peacock shade, and the lion, who is regarded as the king of beasts, is powerless to attack. All this happened because of the intense heat of the season. Now, let's understand that this is how summer season has affected the animal kingdom. Dry throated, foaming at the mouth, maddened by the sun's sizzling rays, tuskers in an agony of growing thirst, 
seeking water do not fear even the lion so the animals they have lost or forgotten all their natural instincts the snake does not fear the peacock the lion does not attack elephants and after reading this particular stanza we understand that the elephants are not afraid of the lions as well no they are also dry throated just like the king of beasts is suffering from intense thirst the elephants are also suffering from you know intense thirst so they have a very dry parched throat and they are foaming at the mouth they are maddened by the sun's sizzling rays sizzling means something which is very hot and tuskers tuskers means elephant in an agony of growing thirst seeking water do not fear even the lion so normally uh, at least they must have gone into the defensive mode now they don't do that because as of now all the animals are you know they have a parched throat they are feeling extremely thirsty and as of now they want nothing else but water peacocks exhausted by the flame rays of the sun blazing like numerous sacrificial fire lack the will to strike at the hooded snake thrusting its head under the circle of plumes so from uh, stanza number 13 we understood that there was a snake who took shelter under the peacock's shade now stanza 13 was written from the point of view of the snake stanza 16 is being elaborated from the point of view of the peacocks peacocks exhausted by the flame rays of the sun flame rays means rays sun rays which you know more or less are like flames blazing like numerous sacrificial fire so you have a simile there the rays of the sun is being compared to the a, a, a sacrificial fire lack the will to strike at the hooded snake thrusting its head under their circle of plumes plumes means feathers so normally a peacock would attack a snake when it approaches when a snake approaches but now the heat is too unbearable for it that it does not want to attack the snake which has taken refuge under its shade so neither does the snake attack the peacock nor does the peacock tormented by the hot sun a herd of wild boars rooting with the round tips of their long snouts in the caked mud of ponds with swam grass overgrown appear as if descending deep into the earth it looks like the herd of wild boars you know wild boars refer to male hawks or wild hawks so it looks like the herd of wild boars are descending deep into the earth just to escape from the hot sun through the caked mud or dry beds of ponds so we see several animals which suffer under this extreme heat uh, that has you know, that they experience as part of this season we have snakes peacocks lions elephants you know, all of them suffering under the extreme heat of the sun and they are trying to they forget even their enmity between them and they are as of now they are trying to escape the intense heat of the sun the blazing sun burning under the sun's fiery wreath of rays a frog leaps up from the muddy pond to sit under the parasol hood of a deadly cobra that is thirsty and tired so in this stanza we have a frog and he is trying to escape the fiery wreath of rays from the sun and where does he find a refuge you know under the parasol hood under the head of a deadly cobra and what has happened to the cobra it is thirsty and it is tired so therefore we understand that you know the uh, frog is not going to be attacked by this deadly cobra because it's it's thirsty and tired a whole host of fragile lotus plants uprooted fish lying dead sarus cranes flown away in fear the lake is one thick mass of mire pounded by a packed elephant herd pushing and shoving so we have a complete scene of a scene of complete destruction in this stanza we have a whole host of fragile lotus plants which have been uprooted 
fish lying dead because there is no water in the pond. We have saras cranes. Saras cranes are a large, a large non-migratory crane which is found in the subcontinent of India, Asia and uh, Australia. So they have flown away in fear because there is no water, there is no food for them. The lake is one thick mass of mire. Mire means thick soft mud. So there is no water and the river, the pond bed, it has become a thick mass of mire. And it has been pounded by a pack of a pack of elephant herd pushing and shoving. Shoving means to push roughly. So they are in their search for water. So they have walked over this pond bed and as a result it has become a one thick mass of mire. A cobra overcome by thirst darts his forked tongue out to lick the breeze. The brilliance of his crest jewel flashes struck by brilliant sunbeams burning from summer's heat and his own fiery poison he does not attack the assemblage of frogs. So a cobra, we saw this cobra in stanza number 18. It's under this cobra that a frog took refuge to escape from the sun's fiery wreath of rays. So this cobra, he is overcome by thirst. He is extremely thirsty. So he darts his forked tongue out. Dart means to put something or to, to, to move something quickly. So he darts his forked tongue. You know how a uh, tongue looks like a snake's tongue looks like so he darts his forked tongue out to lick the breeze so this is what he's trying to do he's trying to lick the breeze and you know cool himself down the brilliance of his crest jewel flashes struck by brilliant sunbeam sunbeams so he have his you know crest jewel you know how a uh, how you know uh, detailed you know, the design of the a snake's hood is so it's it's reflecting the sunlight. It's shining in the presence of the sunlight. And it's burning from summer's heat and his own fiery poison. So he has two reasons to you know, find himself in an extremely uncomfortable situation. The intense heat of the summer season and the heat from his own fiery poison. So he's disturbed by both of these elements. And therefore, he does not attack the assemblage of frogs. So even though it is hungry, even though there is an assemblage of frogs which he could attack, kill and eat, he does not do it because he is extremely thirsty. So that is where we will stop uh, for uh, the moment. Uh, thank you so much for joining me. In the next video lesson, I will discuss the remaining 8 stanzas of Canto 1 Summer. Thank you so much.